Hello? Oh, it's working now. Hello, everybody. Thank you. This is 6.30. I'd like to declare this annual electors meeting open uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and any that have joined us today. Uh, great to see everybody here. I was just talking to one of the media people who mentioned to me they were at uh, the Shara Dardenup's annual electors meeting last week and there was two people there. So not, not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. We'll find out. Just we also want to clarify, there's been just a few conversations with myself and some elected members prior, um, the format for tonight. We have received uh, a number or some questions, I should say, on notice. So those ones that we have received, we do have answers for. Uh, we do take questions from the floor later in the meeting and they will all be recorded and minuted and answered. If we can't answer them tonight, we'll take them and notice and they will be answered and those minutes will be supplied as well. So just bearing in mind that if you haven't prepared a question or you haven't given us notice on that question, we may not be able to answer that question tonight. Um, we'll try our best, but if not, it'll be taken on notice. And the same goes with motions as well. There's a couple of motions received. Uh, anyone can raise a motion from the floor, but um, we'll, we'll deal with that when we get to that. And of course, that motion then forms to the council meeting uh, at the uh, next OCM, which will be in three weeks' time. So also joining me today is, we do have a number of elected members uh, are, uh, spread around the room here. I'll just try and get the ones I can see. Councillor Giles is there, Deputy Mayor Councillor Smith, Councillor Andrew, Councillor Turner, Councillor Kozasek, Councillor McCleary. Anyone else? Councillor, Councillor Turner, who else is back there? Councillor Yip is back there as well. And we do have apologies from Councillor Steck, Steele and Gassett. Uh, I also noticed Sonia Dye is here representing uh, our Minister Don Punch, so any state problems, Sonia can sort those ones out for us, I'm sure, but thanks for coming along, Sonia. <laughs> and uh, we do have a number of members from our exec uh, here. Unfortunately, our CEO is an apology for some family reasons, so <laughs> acting in CEO is Mr Gavin Harris. We have our Director of Planning, um, Gav <laughs> Gary Barber, and Karen Strawn is here as well, um, and Kate from our media and Liam and Greg from Governance, both taking minutes. So we're all here and we're all ready to work through this. Okay. So the first thing we also probably should note is that uh, anyone who hasn't signed in, uh, there is a sign-in book at the, at the back. Um, so yeah, please sign into that if you haven't already. 3.1. Is the mayor's message so we do have the, the annual report here and I will now read aloud my message okay on behalf of the Bunbury City Council it is my pleasure to present the 2021-22 annual report I acknowledge this is Goombra up uh, I acknowledge that Goombra up is on with Dandy Noongar Budja and I'll pay my respect to elders past present and emerging the 2021-22 year has seen another 12 months of maintaining the level of services our community expects while providing improvements to make Bunbury a great city to live, invest and do business. Our community facilities were again a highlight of, cap, uh, of capital projects with Hay Park Pavilion and resurfaced athletics tracks now getting good usage by our sporting and community groups. Progress was also made on Bunbury's highly anticipated youth precinct and by the time the report is published, I suspect our community visitors will be taking full advantage of this amazing facility to be located on our foreshore. And that has happened. <clears throat> Once again, the city received invaluable support from the state and federal governments with the Transforming Bunbury Waterfront project uh, still continuing and through uh, other funding grants. The city also made further progress on its transformation journey with the Evolve program, seeing the establishment of new services and digital solutions to enhance performance and to provide a better service to our community. Our biggest annual events in Christmas in the city and Skyfest returned with great popularity despite the ongoing COVID-19 challenges, while a significant review of the city's grant program provided more of a focus on community-led initiatives and those that encourage people to live, invest and visit Bunbury. I would like to acknowledge the ongoing efforts of our city staff who take great pride in what they do for Bunbury, along with my fellow elected members who continue to represent and advocate for our community. I look forward to the year ahead with some exciting projects due for completion as we continue to build a better and brighter Bunbury. Thank you. So we now need somebody to move that we receive the annual report, which is this document here. Somebody happy to do that? Emily, was that was that you, Emily? 
thank you. Uh, do we need a dress? That's all good? Yeah, cool. And a seconder for that? Thank you. Who's that? Ann Stevenson. Thank you, Ann. Uh, I'll put that recommendation. Those in favour? Any against? None against. That's carried. That's fine. Thank you very much. So we're moving to item four, uh, business of the meeting. Uh, as I said at the start, this is for questions that were, uh, which notice have been given, and we do have a couple of those. And what we'll probably do here is get you to ask all your questions first, and then we'll provide an answer. Uh, so this is important that there's no debate or discussion with these questions. We'll obviously answer, the, answer them, uh, and then we'll go from there. So starting up, we have uh, Mike Fenton. Four, three, two, one. There we go. Um, I think a lot of people have got my questions, but they're not on the uh, overhead. They will be not. But anyhow, so um, the f first question is to do with the invoice of the um, 17th of August 2022. The second question is to do with this, apparently the same invoice, 10th of August 2022. And they're just asking for an explanation for the discrepancies, really. All right, thank you. I'll, um, I'll pass over to our acting CEO to answer those, and I believe we do have the questions on the screen and some answers on that screen as well. So we'll respond to all of those questions now. Uh, thank you. In regards to questions one to four, uh, there'll be some images up on the uh, screen as I read through the uh, explanation. Uh, while in some cases the document's modified date can indicate a change to the content of the document, a common cause of a change to this value is when files are saved and moved. The City's record system lists the created and modified date of this document as the 17th of August 2022. When a copy of this document has been saved to be sent to Mr Fenton, the modified date was changed to the 15th of December 2022, reflecting the date that it was extracted from the record system. Similarly, the date has again changed when Mr Fenton has saved a copy to forward to the city alongside the questions for the annual electors meeting. In the absence of other factors, the modified date of a file should not be taken as evidence of content changes post-creation. Uh, thank you. Yep. That's, uh, they're the responses from one to four. Okay, thank you. Um, the second page is called page two. As to do with the, uh, the invoice that you received from Re Regional Capitals Australia for the subscriptions for the 2016-17, um, you paid um, $8,000 and the invoice, I don't know what the invoice is for, I've never seen it, um, presumably you'll show it to us in a minute, uh, but I presume the 800 for the GST was would have made it $8,800 and the question is... Um, you paid eight thousand dollars. So, what happened to the eight hundred dollars GST? So, in response to that question, it's understood the GST is paid as part of the settlement of invoices from RCA. No, that's fine. Um, it is understood the GST is paid as part of the settlement of invoices from RCA. Correct. Uh, there wasn't a request for the invoice, Mr Fenton. We do have uh, their, their answers that we provided for the questions on notice. If you have further questions, we can take them at the next part of the meeting. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr Fenton. Uh, Mr Kelly, Brennan Kelly. And so I should have acknowledged former councillor and former deputy mayor Brennan Kelly with us as well. Thanks, Mr Thank Mayor. Um, my questions relate to uh, the Bunbury Harvey Regional Council and the Stanley, Waste, uh, Stanley Road Waste Management Facility, uh, which, as we know, has lost its capacity for landfill. Therefore, uh, the city of Bunbury uh, rubbish is buried elsewhere. 
rather than to belabour it, Mr Mayor, I'll uh, just go quickly through them. Um, the uh, precise amount of extraordinary funding, um, uh, ratepayers uh, are aware that extraordinary funding has been provided to the Bunbury Har Harvey Regional Council, mainly to prevent it from trading insolvent. Um, question two, the $3 million allocation uh, to the Bunbury Harvey Regional Council for the capping of uh, the existing unlined cells. Um, I understand the $3 million allocation uh, was matched by the uh, Shire of Harvey and uh, I'm, uh, my question there is whether or not it's a loan or uh, a grant and uh, there's some scheduling to do with the uh, actual capping when's it happening and that might be of interest to people because the longer uh, uh, rubbish can't be dumped out there the, uh, the more expensive it becomes. Question three, the status of the proposal for a new line cell. Um, on the Stanley Road site, whether or not it goes ahead eventually, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, question four, uh, the city uh, completed, oh, this is the important one, I suppose, has the city completed projections on the future cost of waste management to ratepayers in various scenarios? Most ratepayers who looked at their rate uh, notice this year uh, saw that the uh, uh, rubbish component went up in double figures. Uh, it'll probably go up double figures next year and after that as well. Um, um, I think I'll just leave it at that, Mr Mayor, because I think that uh, you're able to um, provide answers to those questions and they'll be put on record. Um, and hopefully that uh, you might see the state government because they've dropped the ball on this. Thank you, Mr Kelly. Uh, we do have some answers for that and I'll pass over to the Acting CEO. Uh, thank you. Uh, in regards to question one, uh, in 2019... 2020, operationally no funds were contributed, capitally no funds were contributed. In 2020-21, operationally zero funds, capital zero funds. In 2021-22, operationally 231,000, capital zero. In 22-23, operationally up to 715,000. Uh, further decision to process 6,500 mattresses a commitment of $199,333.50 and uh, capital, $3 million for the capping project. Uh, there may be a need for further consideration by Council for ongoing financial support to deal with legacy issues, new line cells and operational shortfall. These have not all been quantified at this stage. And then in regards to future, uh, Council decision 299 slash 22, that Council requests the Chief Executive Officer prepare a discussion paper that uh, explores the costs, legal requirements and logistics of implementing a waste levy in accordance with the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Act 2007. Uh, in response to question two, again Council decision uh, 300-22 supports the reimbursement of the City of Bunbury's unlined cell capping contribution, three million principal only, by the Bunbury Harvey Regional Council in accordance with the BHRC dividend agreement with determinations that the payment of dividends to both member councils are to be instituted once surplus funds are generated from the operations of the new land lined cell. In regards to the capping uh, works at the moment, the tender has been awarded. The current funds are sufficient for the required works. Uh, yes, the works have commenced. Uh, it's scheduled to be completed by June 2023, and BHRC has been providing regular updates on the project's progress to city officers and its own council. Uh, in regards to question three, uh, again, council decision 300 slash 22, uh, the council uh, endorse the Bunbury Harvey Regional Council lined cell business case, supports the construction of the first phase of the Stanley Road lined cell project together with the intermediate capping project to be advanced as early as possible, supports the BHRC and member councils seeking capital funding through the expression of interest proposal as the first funding preference and notes that there should uh, should, should there not be suitable line cell development partnership opportunities identified through the EI process that the Chief Executive Officer will return a capital funding model for the line cell and intermediate capping projects to the Council for its approval. Uh, point five in that uh, approves the City of Bunbury 
future allocation for the Bunbury Harvey Regional Council new line cell to be increased from 4 million to 6 million, subject to three and four above, and in an equal proportion to the Shire of Harvey, which is to be repaid by the BHRC through a self-supporting 10-year loan as provided for in the line cell business case. Uh, in regards to the time frame, a licence amendment will be submitted to the Department of Environment and Water Regulations by the end of February 2023. The approval of this will determine the construction time frame. And in regards to question four, uh, investigations have been undertaken in regard to the options for Stanley Road site, including costs for closure, uh, continued operations and utilising existing local waste facilities. This information has been considered by member councils. And in regards to the funding uh, option, that Council 3 requests the Chief Executive Officer prepare a discussion paper that explores the cost, legal requirements and logistics of implementing a waste levy in accordance with the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Act 2007. Thank you, Acting CEO. And we also have questions from Rob Semple. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Rita and myself own the um, 105 A and B Beach Road, which is directly opposite the uh, proposed daycare centre. Our entrance, our entrance and exit is exactly opposite uh, their exit. In December 2021, the city engaged Stephen Carrick Architects to undertake heritage assessments. These heritage professionals submitted their report six months later in June 2022. Six months later in December 2022, the Heritage Advisory Committee met and made some critical decisions and recommendations. My question is, was the city's planning department aware or made aware of the Stephen Carrick report and, and was there any consultation with the Heritage Advisory Committee before the Planning Department made the recommendation to approve the proposed childcare facility at 88 Beach Road? If not, why not? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Semple. Uh, Acting CEO. Uh, thank you. In response, um, out, as outlined in the Council Minutes, item 10.10 .10 of the 29th of November 2022, the application for development approval for a proposed childcare centre at 88 Beach Road was referred internally to the city's heritage officer and externally to the city's external advisor. The planning department was aware of the Stephen Carrick report, Tree Street Heritage Area Assessment July 2022, which identified the existing single house as having a high contribution to the proposed heritage area. The application was also referred to the Heritage Advisory Committee. Subsequent to the above referrals, legal advice was sought as to the validity of applying Clause 67.2K uh, and L under the Planning and Development Local Planning Schemes Regulations 2015, in which the built heritage conservation and cultural heritage significance is to be considered. In particular, legal advice was sought on the validity of refusing the development based on the identification of heritage value of the dwelling as a Category 3. The legal advice received noted the demolition works uh, that are not within a heritage protected place are exempt from development approval and are exempt under Clause 61.1. As the dwelling is not included in a heritage protection area under the scheme, the demolition of the dwelling, single house, could not be included as a matter for consideration before Council. Only the construction and ongoing use of the land for a, land, for a child care premise. Thank you, Acting CEO. And as I mentioned, those answers will be form part of the minutes, uh, as will the questions. So they were the questions that we received um, notice for. We do move now to 4.2, which is questions from electors. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's an opportunity to ask questions. We will try our best to answer. If not, they will be noted and we'll provide answers for them uh, in the minutes. So over to you guys, so questions from the floor. Mr Kelly. Acting CEO. 
uh, it will be uh, uh, put to council for consideration or it won't be uh, done behind closed doors. So it'll be a consideration on the levy and the elements that will make it up. Thank you. And should have mentioned too, if you do have a question, just your name and address as well. For the, just the name for our governance team. Thank you, Mr. Buswell. Uh, We'll just keep you on as part of the action. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, if I may indulge three questions quickly. Sure. One is that at a previous electors meeting, uh, it was proposed <clears throat> that the city look into uh, um, recognising former uh, Bunbury. Um, champions, sporting champions from the early days, from the early 1800s, late 1800s. That hasn't happened. I, I, I request that, if I can, sir, uh, that council revisit a hall of champions for the city of Bunbury going way back into the early times. Sure. I'll, I'll, um, I'll take the question as if anything has happened in that area, which I don't know if I'm getting any looks anyway, and maybe you could actually, we'll take that on notice. You can also potentially move that as a motion in the next part anyway, but onto your second question. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't um, uh, tell you who I was. Uh, former councillor, Michael Buswell, 174 Minnup Road, Bunbury. Um, the other question was, uh, the city has sold a major car park uh, to a hotel company um, we've received a few million dollars in revenue. Will that revenue go back to replacing the lost parking? Sure, and sorry for not acknowledging you as a former councillor, Mr Buswell. Uh, I might ask um, Director of Planning on that, that it, through to answer that one, if I could, thank you, Mr Buswell. One more question. Yes, yeah, probably easier, thank you. Yeah. Um, on my time as a councillor, the council um, nominated a uh, city floral emblem. It's never been recognised. I have asked and phoned uh, council several times to uh, ask, first of all, what is a, the floral emblem for the city? And I've had no reply. Uh, the, minutes will, the minutes of those meetings will verify that, in fact, the city's floral emblem is the Nutzia Floribanda. I'd like to see that promoted in our um, visual and uh, visual promotions that we have. Thanks, Mr. Thank Buzzle. I think we'll take that one on notice and get some information on that. If you have some previous council minutes on that, that'll be great too. And I'll ask uh, the Director of Planning to answer the question around Kabak. Thanks, Mr Mayor. In relation to the parking, yes, the council resolution that agreed to the disposal of that land required that the funds from the sale go into the parking reserve to replace the parking. We do have some questions that have come to us um, through this format as well, so we might just run through those ones before opening back up to the floor again. Um, so, Alex Campbell. Thank you. Uh, my first question relates to the uh, Tree Street Heritage Area Assessment um, provided by Stephen Carrick and Architects. I believe the assessment uh, was funded by a grant. I'm just wondering where the grant, uh, what, what the grant was um, or where it came from and also the cost of the assessment. Uh, my second question just relates also to uh, the City of Bunbury's attendance at the Set Directions hearing next Friday the 10th of February in relation to the proposed childcare centre at the corner of Beach Road and Carey Street. And that is um, whom from the Shire will be representing the city and uh, has the Shire, or the, sorry, the city appointed a legal representative as yet. Thank you, Mr Campbell. And I believe we're going to take those questions on notice. We'll have, those, we'll have some answers for those ones for you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Campbell. And Rita. Oh, Rita's got Rita Haynes. Yes. Okay. Will uh, 
Peter lives next door to the proposed development on the corner of um, 88 Beach Road and Carey Street. And I live next door to her. So I'm two houses from the proposed development. So this question can come from me too. Will the City of Bunby ensure that any damage that will ensue to, over, to our 100-year-old homes, that is, cracking to lath and plaster walls, subsidence of timber foundations, etc., caused by the vibrations, compaction and traffic of trucks and heavy vehicles and heavy equipment during the demolition and build of the proposed development or any future development on this site is satisfactorily repaired and to our residents' satisfaction. So the question is, will the City of Bunbury ensure that, that um, those damages are recovered? Sure, and when we have an answer for that. Thank you, Rita. Well, that's not Rita. Sorry. Um, as if any development approval is granted or building licence is granted, it's incumbent on any developer or builder to um, ensure that there's no damage to adjoining properties and depending on the nature of the development, there may be a requirement for dilapidation reports to be done prior to construction and then assessed afterwards and then it's the developer's responsibility to repair anything that was caused due to any development on any adjoining properties. and recompense us for the damage that will be caused. It's not a maybe being caused, it is a will be caused damage. And the demolition will also cause damage. Sorry? The development was refused by the council. No, but the demolition has been approved. It's demolition and development. No assurance from council or from the city of Bunbury that those Damages can be covered if the developer doesn't <coughs> cover the As the director mentioned, the, the city refused the application. The demolition had no grounds for refusal, but as the director mentioned again, any that they now have to comply with anything they need to do during demolition and the other process, as we know, uh, will go through the, the process it's going through now, through the SAP. Uh, Mr Buckley, David Buckley. Oh, th thank you. And I, sorry, just, I believe there's a few questions here and then a motion, so we'll deal with the questions and then... Yeah, okay. Um, the motion to be affected to. Okay. So, my questions are... Sorry, so... Why wasn't more credence and value given by the planning officers to the undeniable impact to the Tree Street area when deciding to approve the development at Lot 188 Beach Road? Despite the 49 submissions from local residents, the recommendation to reject the proposal from the City of Bunbury Heritage Committee and as recently reinforced in September 2022 by the substantive report from Stephen Craddock and Associates. Any two-storey commercial development makes the area streetscape discontinuous. Any, there are no two-storey commercial developments in this area currently. Any intrusive um, non-contributory development which does not meet the scale and build form of the area will have an impact on that area that will be lost to generations. When you turn up the road into Beach Road from the lights at um, Spencer Street, thank you, um, what you're going to see is if this development goes ahead, you're going to see a two-storey brick building because as the road appears, that's what you see. It doesn't be, meet the form of the streetscape. It doesn't meet the form of the other building. The setback is different. So how was it allowed to um, go ahead? Why wasn't more value put on? Um, if I would jump, I would jump in and, and in defence of the planning team. The, the planning team assessed the application on, on planning permit, and they the planning side the, they determined that what it was. The, the fact that it has discretion, I mean the council had the discretion then to overturn that. So I think the planning have to assess things based on planning grounds, um, and that's what they did in this case. Council use their discretion to overturn that, and, and that's that's the case that we currently have. So the current decision of council was not to approve. And and we support the councillors in um, their decision to overturn it for sure, um, but I still don't understand why it was allowed to go through in the first place. 
Um, and my second question is, what are the zoning plans for Beach Road, East and West of Carey Street? Will future development in this locality again be altered and up for grabs? And if SAT dismiss the appeal, V Lot 188 Beach Road, and the developer repurposes the block, can the City of Bunbury ensure that any development be only a single storey build and in keeping with the streetscape, integrity, authenticity and amenity of the area? As this proposed development currently clearly isn't. I can't answer that one. Uh, Director Planning, can you have an answer? Do you want to take that on notice? Take that one on notice. Thank you. Is there a third question or is that part of your mo um, the motion? I can ask the other one. Um, it's about signage on the building. Um, on the Carry Street side, this is a totally residential street. Yep. And on the Carry Street side, the signage for that development, if it goes ahead, is going to be three metres long by nearly a half a metre deep. That's not appropriate in a residential area. What are the rules for signage? Boarding, etc., in a residential street in a residential area. Let's not have that signage there. It's not needed. Yep. The address we'll, we'll is Beach Road. It's not Carry Street. Put the signage on Beach Road. Sure. Hi. Yep. We have. We, the. I guess the mics in here pick it up very well, so we'll get your question and we'll pick that up in the minutes and get an answer on notice for that one as well. And hopefully it's not referring to the signage policy because that's a very complicated document. Okay, further questions? Any other questions? Yes. My question is just about the traffic on Beach Road and how the cars speed down it. There's no signage saying 50 kilometres per hour, whereas other streets like Spencer and Ocean Drive do. Um, a few of us live in the area and on Beach Road and they have great difficulties getting out of their car because a bit of a blind corner on the corner of Carry and Beach Road intersection, it's, it's a blind corner. So my question is, can the City of Bunbury put in some signage along the Beach Road, William Street from Ocean Drive to Spencer and some other traffic calming measures. Um, I've attached a uh, email conversation that has been going on for a couple of months um, that you can look at and um, I think that's about it. It'll do. Happy to answer? Yeah. Okay. I'll pass that to the Acting CEO. Uh, thank you. Um, so in regards to sign, speed signage, that's not something that council controls, it's actually a main road's responsibility. We can, re we can ask main roads to put it up, we, we can't, because it's a legislative, because they book people for speeding, it actually has to be done by main roads. We can request that it be, be done, but it's main roads who's ultimately responsible. Um, in regards to your issues around the um, uh, traffic management, Generally what we do is we, we, we go on site and collect some data. So we actually collect speed information and everything to see what the issue actually is because, again, sometimes there's a perception of issue and sometimes there's a reality of an issue. So um, I'll commit that we'll get some traffic counts down there and actually investigate uh, what the speed is and then that determines, if there is speeding down there, that determines what treatment we may be able to look at. Um, that then goes into a bit of a competitive process, I suppose, because we have a number of these uh, requests from members of the public, so we have to... Uh, uh, budget for them. So again, um, we'll uh, we'll do that process and see where that ends up, and we'll give you a response back on it. Thank you, Penelope. Uh, further questions? Yes. You just uh, I just remembered I was supposed to ask a question about traffic management. Um, has the council considered at all making Wel Wellington Street from say, um, the, the transport department opposite the call centre, making Wellington Street one way east to west to the beach, and then Simmons Street parallel um, west to east, uh, along past the recreation ground. The reason I ask that is because, for example, Simmons Street buses come down there. I'm one of the rare people in Bunbury who uses buses, <laughs> and um, it's, a, it's a nightmare for the bus drivers, I must say. So can I just ask that question? Thanks. Acting CEO? Uh, yes, uh, that hasn't been considered, no. <laughs> F 
further questions? My name's Alison Martin. I live at 18 Sampson Road in Bunbury and there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask. Firstly, I imagine it comes as no surprise to most of us that there is a significantly greater use of e-bikes and scooters in the local area. Um, and so many of them do far greater speeds than the speeds that they should be doing and that are safe. Um, while I appreciate that this may not fall into council's responsibility to police that, and I understand that, is it possible that spray limit speed reminders be put on footpaths where practical? So, for example, Queen's Park um, Garden, where you get there's a mixture of playground, people zooming through, doing pub crawls from, say, town to the parade. Um, it is also a dog off lead area. Um, we have witnessed a number of incidents of people who have either, you know, been clipped or have been near misses. Um, and my question is, is it practicable for council... I don't know what the rules are associated with it, but can you put a, a 15 kilometre limit spray on the path that's, that reminds people that there is an obligation? And, and that... Look, I'm a cyclist. That applies to cyclists as well. You know, it, it's not... You can't zoom through there on an e-bike at 40 kilometres an hour and think that that's acceptable behaviour, particularly with playgrounds and kids and dogs. Okay. I'm guessing we'll probably take that one on notice to find that. Yeah, we'll, get, we'll take that one on notice to find it. We'll find out the feasibility. Yeah, we'll take it on notice and get a response for that in the minutes. Um, my next question may require a little bit of a story, so bear with me. I've got to again put my specs on. Sorry, okay. And maybe if I turn this way, it's better. Um, okay. My husband and I can't. Oh, God. Yeah, it's good. Oh, shit. My husband and I are currently building a house at 6 Bolton Street in Bunbury. A condition of purchase of this block was planning approval, which was gained in November 21. This included levels for the house floor, the garage and the shed, which were provided and approved. It went to advertising to all adjoining neighbours for comment. A building approval was issued in March 2022 and construction began. We discovered on the 31st of March that the dividing retaining wall owned by our adjoining neighbour, the House of Chi, had the footing in our block, 150 mil. We showed the owner, she claimed it wasn't her problem. Legally, however, it is her problem. We requested assistance from Council's building department to explain this to her in the hope that she would recognise that there was an obligation. Unfortunately, we were told to refer to the Building Commission. However, because the licence was issued in 2008, Building Commission aren't interested. They only last for six years, their investigations. So, um, this new development also meant, because her footing was in our block, that we had to re-engineer the wall and we asked the adjoining landowner again to contribute to our additional costs but was refused. They then contacted uh, the, ex the engineer, the structural engineer, who's an external consultant, um, who did the, the wall in 2008, and consequently, a five-month campaign existed where behind our backs there was a number of meetings by council's executive and the owner because suddenly they, despite the fact that we had approved levels, suddenly they wanted to change the levels. They wanted to move the goalposts. They wanted to make our current building licence change. So there was... Multi and it was literally over 100 millimetres of dirt for a retaining wall that if anybody had half a clue would have realised it was 86 mil taller than the building approval in 2008. And if you want to get a 100 mil a difference, dig out 100 mil on your side. So there was multiple meetings between council's executives where either us or our builder were never invited and were never corresponded with. In fact, on multiple occasions, I had to remind city employees to stop contacting me and contact the builder because he owned the building permit. Eventually, there was a check on the floor levels by council's building surveyor and she said in writing that we were done, that if we had met all the requirements of the building permit, it went to bed. But she went on holiday 
And this was brought up again. And there was a meeting with council's executive, a private building surveyor, the same engineering consultant, and I believe the owner. Yet again, we were never invited or even corresponded with. When Rachel returned, um, we received correspondence where they were negotiating saying, if she builds a retaining wall this high and she compacts it, will that meet requirements? No, hang on, we already have a building permit. It's already approved. Why do you get the right to renege and change and reverse things over 100 mil? The, the distress and the unacceptable behaviour by City Council's executive is not okay. It is only because I have a professional background that I was able to push back. A conversation with the CEO, I explained that my next call was to SAT. I was lodging a formal complaint about the behaviour of senior executives and the building department. I explained that the retaining wall was not the approved plan. So my question to you guys is, how is this acceptable? How do you get to put me through hell for five months, put my building on hold over 100 mil of dirt and nobody from the council contacts us? We don't get... I get copies of emails that are sent to the engineer, the external engineer, negotiating, OK, if she builds a retaining wall this big, this high, and she compacts it, will that suffice? No, I had a building permit. I had approvals. I had levels. You don't get to do that. That is not acceptable. And so then my next question is, I asked council on multiple occasions to compel this business to install a bollard so in the disabled bay because anybody who drives through that bay will hit our structure and they will fall 1,200 metres over a wall. Every other bay in that business is bollarded, except the disabled bay. When I asked council for it to be sorted out, I was told the only bay they can compel is the disabled bay. That was in March, still not done. How many times do I have to ask for it to be sorted? And then my final question is, there is something in the residential planning codes called uh, street surveillance, right? which means that when you have a driveway, you are required to be able to see when you drive out onto your driveway. I have a retaining wall from the adjoining landowner, which is between 900 and 1100 high. Anybody can have a fence 1200 high. On top of that, she has an 1800 high metal fence. So when we exit our garage, we will have 2.4 metres and it is 1.5 metres from the end of her fence to where the road starts. It's actually about 1.3. So how are we safely expected to enter the road? I asked for that to be removed. I was told in writing, no, that was acceptable. I had a conversation with the CEO. He agreed with me. It wasn't acceptable. That was September last year. Nothing has happened. Why is it that certain people seem to get meetings with executives, all these things done, and I ask simple questions that are associated with safety and nobody will, nobody will even send us an email, nobody will answer us, nobody will do us the courtesy of telling us what's going on. I'm sorry, but I don't find your behaviour acceptable. Thank you for your questions. I might, uh, I'm not sure we got all those ministers. We'll certainly take one notice. Could we, if you're happy or to provide those questions as well with us um, so we can respond to that and they'll be visited. And sorry, you've been through that. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, I would just like to address the question of heritage listing for properties that... Um, has just come to notice this year. My husband and I bought a property in Wellington Street 40 years ago, and we've been looking after it, I would say, to a very high standard. Um, on a particular day, somebody slipped a letter underneath the door. Um, it, the, the building is actually vacant at the moment, so nobody was occupying it. And it had, to the occupier, um, and there was no other private 
no other information on the envelope, so we may or may not have gotten it. Um, and it was from the council. Now, I know that you have our names and address. We get our rates every year without a problem. So I wondered why, out of politeness, respect, or privacy at least, that those letters that a lot of people got weren't addressed to the names and the address of the owners of the building, and not just left under the door for the occupier, which it doesn't really um, have anything to do with the occupier or the person renting the place. So why wasn't that seen to in the right way? Sorry, I might have missed the first part. So where, who was the letter from? Pardon? Who was the letter from? Uh, it was from, was it from the city of Cap? Yep. Yep, my husband just said yes. Okay, he was sorry. the one that found it. I don't know how long it had been sitting yep. there. We'll have, to, we'll have to check that on, on rec we'll have to take that on notice. Um, of course, we'll, residential, whatever we have on file, on, on, I'm assuming the lecture roll will be whatever postal address will be on file. So we'll have to have a look in that, but we'll take that one on notice and find out for you. Okay, appreciate it then. One other thing, um, the letter contained a lot of private information about our building. We had no idea that that was going to be added to the list because it hasn't been on the list before. Um, it had information about the property, information about uh, all the dimensions of the property, photographs of the property from four different angles, um, and a lot of things which I would have thought would be private and confidential. And I don't know how many people got these letters, but, but according to the uh, appendixes that were attached, there were a lot. And, you know, do we not have um, the right to privacy about things like this? Because we weren't very happy with that. Yeah, no, I understand, and we'll take it on notice and find out what's what's going on there. Sorry? We'll take that on notice and we'll find out exactly what's, what's happened there and where that's come from. Um, our objection to be listed was uh, rejected, but at no time have we had the chance to speak to anybody in person. So apart from the one letter we got initially that we finally did get and the fact that we sent in an objection or we thought we had the choice to choose because we own the building, um, it, we were told by phone that our objection was um, denied and do we have no way to speak to anybody privately about this or is that the end of it? Sure, I think we, we can have a chat after this meeting about uh, find out exactly what's going on and we can have that conversation so I'll catch up with you after this meeting. Okay, that would be appreciated, thanks very much. Thank you. Is there any further questions? All good? Haven't missed any. All right, thank you. So we do move on to now motions. Uh, so we do have two motions that we've had notice of. Uh, the first one being Tracy. Tracy Cow. Good evening, Mr Mayor, fellow councillors and all others present. My name is Tracy Cowan. I'm a resident of Bunbury. Thank you for the opportunity to bring to the council's attention the need for improvements to the John Banks Memorial Dog Park. I would like to put forward the following motions. That council create a master plan for the John Banks Memorial Dog Park, which includes consultation with the John Banks Memorial Dog Park Committee and users of the park by June 30, 2023. I would like the council to include a line item in the 2023-24 and ongoing budget for an agreed amount to fund improvements to the John Banks Memorial Dog Park located on Parade Road with us. I would like to include a motion that asks for the dog park to be extended to utilise the existing open space in the area, which is approximately an additional 200 square metres. I would like the City of Bunbury to review the dog exercise areas with the intention to identify future additional enclosed dog parks in consultation with the John Banks Memorial Dog Park Committee. Once these areas are identified, Council to update the City's open spaces and parks strategic plan. Cool. <coughs> Thanks, Tracy. I should have probably explained too. So for each motion, we'll have a, a mover and a seconder. And I'm assuming Tracy will move that and a seconder. Thank you. Ros, thank you, Ros. And so now at this stage, Trace, you have the, the opportunity to speak to it and speak in favour of your motion. I promise you it's less than five minutes. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Jong Banks Memorial Dog Park community. In January 2021, I approached the City of Bunbury and Don Punch to look at the possibility of an additional fully fenced dog park in Bunbury and to understand any future planning for the John Banks Memorial Dog Park. I wanted to gather support for improving the options available to dog owners, wanting a space to exercise their dog that had access for all abilities and encouraged community engagement and involvement. I was asked by the City to initially focus on the enhancement and improvement of the existing enclosed dog park. In May 2021, we undertook a pop-up community survey which captured over 160 local users. Through the survey, it showed how important this park is to residents and demonstrated the value of the park as an opportunity for seniors in the community to socialise and feel safe. It was made clear to us that park users were jaded as different groups over the past few years have asked for improvements to no avail with the park continuing to be an eyesore. Partway through 2022, a small committee was formed to work together to continue the momentum to improve the park. We have taken it on ourselves to raise funds, or to try and raise funds, to assist with the improvements. We have held a movie fundraiser and currently in conjunction with the Hudson Road Family Centre, the PCYC and the South West Sports Centre are organising a pause walk and youth fair for the 30th of April. I have also been attending the Withers Regional Renewal Project discussions run by the Department of Communities to see how we can all work together towards a common goal. After numerous community meetings, we've identified improvements which would contribute to the revitalisation and transformation of what is currently the only fully fenced dog park in Bunbury. And when I checked a few months back, it was also the only fully fenced dog park south of Mandra. A draft concept plan has been drawn up to incorporate these things. The park currently lacks, lacks several basic elements. Concrete pathways, necessary to ensure inclusion and accessibility for all. Shade structures to encourage community members to congregate and form new relationships. Options for separate exercise areas for large and small dogs or active and less active dogs, which would in turn encourage confidence for people to access the facility. Dog exercise equipment. Additional fresh drinking water fountains safe, accessible and convenient parking, a suitable entry gate to allow for wheelchair access, play equipment for the dogs, reticulation. Additionally, we think responsible dog ownership is key. A community notice board to promote community activities and engagement could address this. Working with the lo local dog users to develop agreed rules for park usage would encourage ownership. In speaking with the city's co-design disability access panel, CODAP, we identified that the inclusion of an AAC board would assist park users that may have communication difficulties. The men's shed have completed a purple bench for installation at the park. The bench has been built with a disability design to accommodate a wheelchair space. The idea being that the person in the wheelchair can back into the space and engage easily with the people either side of them. Unfortunately, the bench is sitting in city storage as we need to provide a concrete path directly from the access gate to the bench and ideally a shelter. With all the positive changes that we see occurring in Bunbury, we would like to be able to confirm to our dog owners that they are important too. Anecdotally, we know the current conditions of the park discourages many people from visiting. An improved park can only have a positive effect on the community, enhance the park's potential to be a hub for community gatherings and be a place for our dogs to learn good manners and appropriate social interactions through safe and secure play. That was it. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. <clears throat> uh, Ros, as seconder, do you have anything further to add? Oh, nothing, sorry, there was nothing further. Do you have the option to speak if you'd like to? You're all good? No, all good? Fine. Cool. Good, very good. Uh, is there any speakers against this motion? Very good. So what, we do, what we'll do here, we'll, we'll put the motion. Um, so obviously you have the, the option to vote in favour or against. So I'll put the, all those in favour. Any against? That's carried. Thank you. So that, uh, that motion will form, uh, will come to next OCM in three weeks' time. Uh, obviously, your motion will come, and then the, the executive recommendation will have uh, covering uh, any points that needs to from there. And that'll be coming three weeks' time. Thank you. <clears throat>
We also have a motion that we received notice from from Mr. Bischoff. Bernard. My motion is the City Council consider including funds in the 2023-24 budget for the purchase of the uh, first official plan of the Town of Bunbury. I've changed this uh, motion a little bit by saying that at least some funds, um, so including at least some funds in the 2023-24 budget. So, Mr. Bishop, your motion, the, uh, what you presented to us was the City Council consider including funds. You were suggesting just adding the word some. At least some. At least some. How are we going now? Okay. Uh, so, you're happy to move that. I'm assuming, Mr. Bishop, do we have a seconder for that? You happy to second that? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. You can speak uh, to your motion. Uh, this plan has been for sale at Muir's Old and Rare Books in Perth, where it has been kept for Bunbury for some years and where it is waiting for its return to Bunbury to be safely housed and displayed at the Bunbury Museum and Heritage Center. The 43 by 56 centimeter size original plan, a larger almost by half than A3 size, was previously owned by the Princip Estate on this one copy of only two known. It's beautifully mounted for hanging. Its asking price is uh, 39,000, so it's quite expensive. My attempts to have the purchase sponsored at first by Andrew Forrest because of his connections to Bunbury and then by BHP because of their interest in mining for bauxite in the Jarrah Forest have not been successful. The plan depicts not only ominous surveys of the town site of the peninsula from Stirling Street North in great detail, but also the lively landscape of dunes, flats, and tidal creeks, just how the local indigenous population enjoyed and used it for many thousands of years. Before the dunes were used as a sandpit to fill in the low-lying tidal areas. This is a very significant document which has the potential I'm fairly confident to become the catalyst for a new understanding of Bunbury of itself, of its spectacular landscape and fascinating and unusual history and how its history is reflected in the Bunbury of today. This 1443 town plan of Bunbury is the result of the hard work of four uh, surveyors out um, between 1829 and 1841, uh, Lieutenant Preston and Dr. Colley, the Surveyor General, Charles Rowe, Surveyor Thomas Watson, and finally Surveyor H.M. Omani. However, it's important to realize that none of their work would have happened, certainly not within the first months of the Colonies Foundation, without the driving force, the authority and the want for good land at Port Lashnold of Lieutenant Governor Sterling. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Anything further from the seconder? Uh, that was Ms. Rackman back there, I think. Penny? Anything to add? All good, thank you. Is there a speaker against this motion? It is on the screen at motion one. A speaker against that at all? Happy to put that. All those in favour of that motion, please indicate. Uh, any against? None against? That's carried. Motion one is carried. And you have another motion, Mr Bishop? 
The other motion is also to do with history. The City Council consider in relation to the birth date of Bunbury that Sterling reported in March 1831 that he went a year earlier in March 1830 to Port where he selected the position of a town and established a military station there for the protection of its earlier inhabitants. Do we have a seconder for that motion? Thank you, Mr. Buswell. Thank you, Bernard. Bunbury traditionally regards the 21st December 1836 as its birthday based on the story of the meeting between Lieutenant Bunbury and Governor Stirling, at which, according to Lieutenant Bunbury, the governor named the place Bunbury in his honour. I'm sorry if I'm causing some pain to those who feel that Lieutenant Bunbury is more important than the Governor Sterling and that the 1836 date should remain. But it seems important that the City Council has a closer look at what happened in 1830 at Port Lashnold because the bicentenary, surely a major future event, may only be seven years away. I'm quoting Sterling's words as printed in the general report on the progress, condition, and prospects of His Majesty's colony in Western Australia up to the 31st of March, 1830. In March last year, I proceeded to Port Lesnold for the purpose of inspecting that district and after selecting a position for a town, I left there a detachment of soldiers to protect its earlier inhabitants. And he provided stores and supplies for a six months stay of the um, military station, so between March and August 1930. This report by the Governor Sterling himself, which has not yet received the attention it deserves, strongly supports the various other arguments for the March 1830 date of Bunbury's beginnings, which have been researched and assembled of uh, several decades. The arguments for the March 1830 uh, have been debated in some circles so far without resolution. This report by the governor himself seems to leave little doubt that it was he who is responsible for the beginning of Bunbury in early March 1830, and who therefore could be regarded as the founder independently of whether his town of Port Lesnold succeeded or not as he planned it. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Mr. Buswell? Just grab, the, grab that mic off you there, Bernard, for your seconder. <clears throat> I recommend this um, motion uh, on the grounds that for too long has the city of Bunbury forgotten our history. For too long has the city of Bunbury forgotten our heritage. For too long and for too often have we destroyed some of our heritage um, buildings. And um, Bernard's right in bringing this uh, motion forward and the previous motion. Um, the city of Bunbury has a responsibility to, to reserve the history and the um, heritage of this great city. Thank you, Mr. Buswell. Is there a speaker against? Happy with that. Those in favour of motion two, please indicate. Thank you. Those against? That's carried. So, Mr. Bishop, both those motions are carried. And as you're aware, they will appear in three weeks' time. Thank you. We have uh, one other motion which wasn't received on 
notice, but I did get it handed to me before. I don't know if we have an opportunity to get that on the screen from Mr Fenton. Um, so you may just have to read it out, Mr Fenton. I don't think we have an opportunity to get it on screen. <coughs> just in relation to my previous questions, um, more like a, uh, that was a puzzle, this is a solution. Um, Bunbury Council, um, uh, I'd like to um, move the following motion. Bunbury Council in instigate an internal audit and testing of specific financial transactions involving payments of public monies to Regional Capitals Australia, Victoria, as evidenced by A, the Regional Capitals Australia invoice created on the 17th of August, B, the Regional Capitals invoice created on the 10th of August, and C, the historic Regional Capitals invoice uh, of $8,000 for 2016-17, and on completion of the investigations of A and B and C, the resultant audit report is forwarded to the City of Bunbury Audit Committee. Thank you, Mr Fenton. Is there a second uh, to that? Thank you, Mr Kelly. Ms Fenton, you can speak to that motion. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. Points A and B in my motion concern the 2022-23 Regional Capitals $11,000 subscriptions. Uh, but you can see why I, I'm confused and I think an audit is in, in order and that is because um, according to the Regional Capitals website today, subscriptions for 2022-23 are $8,500 plus GST. Uh, on the other hand, Mayor Henley in Busselton advised one of his ratepayers that Busselton's paid $10,000 this year for their Regional Capitals um, subscriptions. And as noted by me in point C, regional capital subscriptions for 2016-17 were 8,000, presumably $8,800, including GST. Bunbury only paid 8,000. So um, I'm still up, I'm still really confused about where the GST went. Uh, if another entity raised regional capitals incorporated uh, 2016 invoices, it, it is actually a breach of the Victorian Incorporations Act model rules. Uh, directors are required to create re regional capitals, own financial documents and pay all revenues directly into their own bank account. So I'm just concerned that while Bunbury continues to pay ratepayers fund funds to regional capitals incorporated in Victoria, the reputation of the city of Bunbury, and I'm sorry to say, Mr Mayor, because you're a director yourself, uh, you, both reputations are being put at risk. Regional Capitals is registered as an incorporated association in, in Victoria. And um, yesterday I spoke to a person uh, just to get it, make sure that I was actually quoting correct information. And the person told me, uh, the Consumer Affairs told me that the directors are currently in breach of their obligations under the Act as follows. They failed to lodge the 2021 financial returns on time, failed to lodge this year's AGM and they're overstating their financial membership statistics. So I commend this motion to you simply as a way of um, clearing the air, really. Thank you, Mr Fenton. Mr Kelly. Thanks, Mr Mayor. Look, uh, uh, I was very happy to second this motion on the basis that we need to get rid of it. We need to actually finalise something for Mr Fenton. This has been going on for about five years. Uh, RCA is a tad controversial because your ratepayers' money are funding uh, RCA, uh, which is nationally uh, set up. And as uh, Mr Fenton quite rightly pointed out, uh, he's been in contact with the incorporations uh, people in Victoria and found that they are actually non-compliant. And I uh, accept that that's the truth. So um, I think this is a very simple motion that draws a line under uh, these particular uh, questions, which were answered, to be fair. Uh, to some extent by Mr Harris tonight. Uh, once it's in writing, that's it. Line under it. And uh, if RCA is to continue operating uh, in Australia and if Bunbury is to continue to be a member of RCA, Regional Capitals Alliance, uh, then so be it. But uh, we really need to draw some uh, line under what's happening here. So uh, I recommend that everybody supports this. Uh, it's a fairly simple answer. Um, and I don't think it'll be overly onerous on the uh, governance people of the City of Bunbury to provide that answer. So please support the motion. Thank you, Mr Kelly. Is there a speaker against the motion? We don't have it up on the screen, but uh, I think we all, 
recognise what it is. Is there... Uh, I'll put this to a vote then. Those in favour? Any against? Thank you. That's carried. Okay. So there are the motions I've received. Are there any other motions from the floor? All good. Thank you very much. That brings us to a close. Uh, so before I do close, as I said, to those motions that are carried, I've mentioned that a few times now, they will form, they'll come to council at the next OCM um, for discussion at that stage. So put that in your calendars for three weeks time. Uh, and anyone, those who might have asked questions, if you haven't had a chance to, if you have your questions with you, I think it'll be a, um, a good opportunity to pass them to Greg and our government's team. He's very good at capturing minutes, but just to ensure that your question was fully captured, I'd ensure I get to them. But uh, thank you all very much for coming out on this Tuesday evening, and for anyone wanting to chat further, we'll be hanging around from there. So thank you very much. The next... Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you. Three weeks. Three weeks, time.